In this video, I'm replying to climate-related comments and questions on the YouTube channel. This is the Malin Baker, well, it's not really the Malin Baker show, this is just me chatting to you. So, as you know, I'm in Argentina, and I thought that while I was here, I would do this video so that at least I've got something that's going up um, while I'm busy lecturing Scandinavians about corporate social responsibility, because that's what you do when you're in Argentina. So, I've pulled out a few of the comments from the channel that there's something interesting to talk about. Um, I'm sure that there are other comments that you would wish that I would talk about. If you think that this is an interesting format, then let me know and we can do it again. If you absolutely hate it, that's fine. We never have to do it again. We'll just see how it goes. So anyway, let's go straight in to the first comment. So there was this one, which was on the video, the most recent one to do with the anti-Greta. Greta says, don't listen to me, listen to the scientists. He's quoting me at that point. Where do you get off telling a complete lie? Your bias is showing through again. What she actually says are things like, the earth is on fire, I want you to panic, adults act like children, so it's up to the children, and so on and so on. There's a whole list of similar ones. Not very scientific, is it? If you really believe that her followers listen to the science and not the above shallow, meaningless words, which makes up the vast majority of her speech content and written for her by others with a political agenda, you are being naive in the extreme. Right. Well, there you go. That's telling me. Of course, what he's really doing is misreading what I said. And what he's put in the comment kind of confirms what I said. My point was that uh, Naomi Zeit was making the attempt to make scientific arguments. And the whole challenge for a young person positioned as the child, she's a young adult, of course, but positioned as the anti-Greta, the, the child voice, is that you don't have authority when it comes to making scientific arguments. And particularly if you're up against you know, the scientific consensus, then, then starting to make scientific arguments, you start with a credibility deficit. And I said, well, that's not what Greta does. Her strategy is, yes, she makes these polemical statements that, you know, if you betray us, we will never forgive you and all those sorts of things. She doesn't make the scientific arguments. And that's a very smart play for somebody in her position because she doesn't have credibility in terms of scientific arguments. She does have credibility as a spokesperson for her age group. And I say that, <coughs> excuse me, I say that advisedly because, you know, I don't believe that people can just self-appoint themselves as being representatives for any group. You see it quite often on comments, when, particularly when you're talking about issues relating to the intersectionality debates and so on, where you get people claiming to represent people of colour or claiming to represent trans people or whatever it is, self-appointed people don't get to speak on behalf of their community if they're not voted in order to do so. Uh, and it's the same way with Greta, because even though she is heading a substantive movement and it's pretty large, uh, I mean, it is a phenomenon. I, I, whatever you think about the Greta phenomenon, and there's plenty of people on my channel who really don't like it, and I get that absolutely, it is a remarkable phenomenon. You know, we had a mass turnout in Bristol recently for her being there. So she represents a group of people who are self-selecting to go to those sorts of events. Is she? Would she be right to claim, I don't know if she's actually claimed this, but if she was to claim that she was speaking for her generation totally, would she be right for that? Almost certainly not. Because if you look at the number of young people who go on the school strikes, they're substantial in some areas. But they're by no means a minor, they're by no means a majority of the people from those schools. The vast majority of young people in those schools are staying in school. Does that mean that it's meaningless? That it can be discounted? No, of course not. Uh, there's only ever a minority who take action over a cause or an issue. So the question is always, well, how big is that group? When British members of parliament used to get a letter back in the days when we would send stuff in the mail and it would cost you the price of a stamp, although in those days the price of a stamp wasn't quite as bad as it is these days, MPs used to rate 
that for every letter they got, that represented the opinions of a hundred of their constituents. Uh, and that was how they thought, well, OK, that, that's about the number, that's the percentage who would actually take enough action to let them know what they thought about an issue, as opposed to all the others who think the same and don't bother. We don't know exactly what percentage of people gets represented. If you look at the recent Democrats primaries, we've just had Super Tuesday with uh, Biden uh, leaping back into the fray. And I saw a graph which I uh, retweeted uh, a few hours ago, which is incredibly low turnout from young people in those primaries. For all that Bernie Sanders was meant to be leading the youth generation, the revolution, and that all of these young people are desperately concerned about climate change, amongst other things, and therefore we're going to step up to the plate. There is no evidence that larger numbers of young people are actually taking part in those sorts of processes than have ever taken part in the past. It's always been a minority. So how important the Greta phenomenon is, personally, I don't give a huge amount of credence to any of the principles of young people being representatives for scientific arguments. Um, I am interested because I talk about campaign effectiveness on this channel as well as the scientific thing. You understand those people who watch this regularly know that I talk about um, how to be an effective change maker. One of them is seeing the world clearly, which is where the science comes in. The second is knowing what to do about it, which is where campaign strategy comes in. I'm interested in what works and what doesn't in terms of campaign strategy and something that I personally dislike may nevertheless turn out to be effective. So I will talk about those sorts of things. But when it comes to deciding about the issues of climate change, of course, we don't listen to children uh, particularly. So the, the other thing I want to say about this comment is that towards the end, they move towards a different sort of mode because... The commenter jumps from the point where I'm describing her communication strategy to assuming that I'm advocating for her. You know, if you really believe that her followers listen to the science, blah, 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 blah. Well, of course, I didn't say that her followers listen to the science. And if you've watched any of my videos on Extinction Rebellion, you would know that that's not my position at all. You know, the extremes on both sides of this debate cherry pick the science to fit their preconcerned position. Um, I am interested in the people in the middle who genuinely want to follow the science and where the science says that there's cause for concern, they're concerned, and where the science says, well, well you know, Roger Hallam might say billions of people are going to die, but the science doesn't back that up, and I will draw attention to the fact that the science doesn't back that up. Do Greta Thunberg's followers really listen to the science? No, they listen to mostly the science as interpreted through news headlines, which, as we know, can be an extremely dodgy thing to do. Yeah, or they see it as translated for them by the campaigners, which can be an even more dodgy thing to do. But they trust those people. They believe that they're telling the truth. And so they believe in the version of the science that they're being told. And that, I think, is one of the problems that we have to grapple with. Anyway, that's enough on that one. The next comment comes from the video that was on tipping points. And it goes like this. In the history of man as a distinct species, there have been at least three near extinction events that would make any disaster scenario climate alarmists come up with look like come up with look like a pleasant holiday in southern Spain. Okay, well we know what he's saying. Anything short of all water on the planet freezing solid in near zero Kelvin temperatures or all water boiling off permanently, the planet, most life and probably humans will survive. Yeah, so... So, OK, you get variations of this argument, which is why it's on here. This is possibly the most extreme form of it, which wasn't deliberate, it's just the most recent one. Um, which is that you know, climate has always been changing. And if you look back through uh, geographical history, geological history, then you will find that the climate has changed and therefore it's fine. And that's a, a weird argument because we don't know, we weren't there when those changes happened and exactly how difficult they were for life to survive we can only speculate. We know that in the time of the dinosaurs, there was a period when there was a mass extinction, which the dinosaurs survived. Whoopee! 
their immediate competitors who had been dominant over them in that previous period mostly died out and that was the one before the dinosaurs then became the preeminent um, species in the in, in the food chain as it were we, we entered the age of the dinosaurs proper well it's all very well if you're the ones that happily survive and the others die out but do we honestly think we're going to toss that particular coin? I mean, this sort of thing of probably humans will survive. It's the word probably in that sentence. I think you would say any world leaders would be expected to be slightly concerned about the prospect of a probably in the phrase humans will survive. I mean, I don't see where else to go with that, so I'm not going to spend any more time on it. Uh, let's go to someone from the other side, and this one's from Twitter. Uh, Adam at Total Carbon Rationing uh, commented on the Tipping Points video again. Usually great vids, thank you, but in this you seriously downplay Tipping Points, and then he provides a link to a Carbon Brief article uh, explaining nine potential Tipping Points. The AMOC shutdown, he means the Atlantic Meridian, Mer Meridional... <laughs> The Atlantic Meridional, Meridional, I don't know, how the hell do you pronounce that? That thing overturning circulation. Um, the AMOC shutdown, if it happens, possibly wipes out arable farming in the UK. No dates given, but implication is we are playing with fire. Are you too keen to take one of XR's favourite toys away? Uh, there's a couple of things in that. One is uh, I'm forever being told that I'm have some ulterior motive for looking at stuff. I look at stuff that I find interesting. I'm always looking for what are the best arguments against, where are the, where are the points of contention in all of this discussion? What are the most interesting issues? Where do the grey areas live? Because I find those interesting. And this whole question about tipping points had come up a number of times. I was aware that if you're going to take the Extinction Rebellion catastrophist viewpoint, then the tipping points is the view by which you do that. But it was mostly just because I saw an article where um, somebody was summarising the state of the science, and I thought, well, that actually looks pretty interesting. It looks like there's lots of grey areas there. Let's look at that, and let's look into the sources, and let's create a video out of it. And I represented the conversation that I saw there amongst scientists the way that I saw it. And what Adam seems to be suggesting is that by doing that, I was downplaying something. Now, I don't see how that can be the case. If you see a conversation happening between scientists, and I'm not a scientist, I never claim to be a scientist. What I'm doing is I'm looking to see what the scientists are saying to each other, <clears throat> what discussion they're having. And what you don't want to do in that situation is to rank the scientists, you know, so long as they are what they say they are because you know this is one thing that people are forever doing you know that, that the scientists whose personal opinions agree with my own i'm going to describe those as the most distinguished climate scientists and the other side you know they're lesser being charlatans even maybe depending on who you're talking to and then the other side do the same for their preferred scientists and so on well i'm not going to play that game so this was really just a reflection of you know what is the conversation and what do people seem to be saying how is this reflected in the official IPCC documents? As far as I can tell, you know, I've, I've, I looked at the document that he linked to and it was mostly quoting the people who I'd already quoted in the video. Um, the things like the, the AMOC shutdown had all of the qualifications that I included in the video saying, you know, there's no evidence that this is going to happen at 1.5 degrees or, or 2 degrees. And, you know, probably we're talking about something that's over 100 years and so on and so on. And this, and this was the message that I got, that potential tipping points generally are not short term. They are longer burn processes. And we, you know, if we take action and we change course, then we will avoid them. There's an if in that sentence. It's quite important. Uh, whereas the short term things that might genuinely happen quite quickly, and I mentioned the um, killing off of coral reefs, Tragedy, absolute tragedy for biodiversity. I really hope that doesn't happen. But it's not a tipping point. It doesn't have that cascade thing going that the, the people who point to this and say potential catastrophe on the horizon seem to have. Now, as I say in the video, and I've said since in comments, you know, I watch the 
developing science in this area with interest because it is one of those areas where the science is not settled and we learn more as we go about the chaos and complexity of systems because the other challenge with tipping points is you don't always see them coming. And of course, there's an absolutist campaign argument to say, oh, precautionary principle, if there's even a 1% chance, then we have to act as though it's a certainty. The trouble with that is if it's going to drive you to do things that for certainty are going to have massively more damaging consequences than the alternative, which is what absolute zero carbon by 2025 would do, for instance. We don't have to speculate that would have massive negative consequences. So we're always sort of saying, well, OK, what is the action we can take that's the best outcome for people and for the planet? And there's a lot of different factors that you're weighing up there. The, the problem with the climate extremists, the genuine extremists, is that they see it as a, a unidimensional thing. There's one variable that is put above all else. And in a complex system, it's never just one variable. And, and the same goes to the other side. OK. Uh, Adam at Total Carbon Rationing, thank you for your tweet. Uh, let's go back to YouTube comments. Uh, we have Wally Blackler, also on tipping points. I was born in the 60s. They said one thing in the 60s, said another thing in the 70s, and now look in the 80s and 90s, it said something else. So they have been lying the whole time. I get a lot of comments of a similar sort to this, and it is basically these unconnected people in the past were wrong about something, Therefore, these people in the present must be wrong about this completely unconnected thing. When I describe it like that, you can probably see the inherent flaw in that line of argument. You know, ultimately, we filter what we choose to give significance. And if I look back at any individual scientist, and most of the time when people say this stuff, they're actually referring to newspaper headlines and politicians and so on and so forth. But even if we just talk about scientists, because there are certainly some scientists who are saying different things, different periods. Um, if you look at any individual person, they will have been right about some things. They will have been wrong about some things. Just the same as you, just the same as me. Hopefully I've been right about some things, but I've definitely been wrong about some things. Now, if you choose to look at somebody's entirety, you can choose any of those in order to make a narrative like this. You can say, oh, well, Malin was wrong in his 30s. He was wrong in his 40s. Now he's in his 50s. Do we think we should believe what he says? Well, of course, ultimately it comes down to, well, was he more right than wrong? And on this particular subject that we're talking about, has he been more right than wrong? And more to the point, really, when it comes to this, what's the evidence? Because it's not as though we're being asked to take individual scientists' word purely on the merit of who they are. You know, they produce research. It is published into peer-reviewed journals. You can look at the research. You can argue with it if you think it's wrong. Um, and you know, sometimes people do, and sometimes research gets modified or withdrawn, and that's the system working. You know, it's the best system we've got. It's not perfect as people like to point out. But because it's not perfect, doesn't mean you throw it away and simply deal with blogs or something. So I could point back to the same people that you point to and say, oh, well, they were wrong then, and yeah, these other people must be wrong now. And I could point all of the times when scientists have done amazing things. Scientists got us to the moon. You know, scientists solved problems like acid rain and the ozone hole. Scientists are fabulous, awesome people. You could point at all of those things and say, do we dare disbelieve them now? Just as easily. So as an argument, I mean, it's a fallacious argument anyway, because you're not referring to the same people. You're referring to different people on unconnected issues. It's a nonsensical, logical chain. But even if you took it you know, as is... You can so easily turn it around and do it the other way if that was your inclination. That's why it's really a meaningless argument. OK, um, we then have Chris Kerwent um, on the Do the Scientist Fake Data uh, video. Good evening. Good evening. You have still not responded to my invitation. Well, I get a lot of comments, so I may or may not see your comment. You just don't take it personally if you don't get a response. You have still not responded to my invitation at the end of our recent discussion 
for an explanation of why the Arctic was ice-free 6,000 years ago and almost ice-free in 1921-22, which obviously CO2 could not have caused. Have you nothing to say? You yourself consistently cherry-pick periods and consistently fail to cover anything before 1900. Well, um, so I've never suggested that the only reason why historical temperatures have moved you know is because of co2 it's a complex system there's there's not only one cause to why things happen um as i understand it from some of the uh, the geological time frame history that warming periods have been begun by changes with the milenkovitch cycle the the the, the strength of the solar inputs into the earth and that then carbon dioxide has been released from that initial warming and then that's provided extra feedback and generated more warming so in that sense then it would have been entirely consistent i haven't looked specifically at the geological time frame it's it's, it's an area that's quite interesting um so it's something that i would probably look at at some point um but why you should say why have you not said anything about this um, seems a bit weird, really. Um, I'm finding my way through all of this stuff as I look at different areas that interest me. And the fact that I haven't gone on to your particular area of interest yet um, is not a moral failing of mine, I would put it to you. That's all I'm going to say on that one. Oh, and cherry-picking time periods. I, no, I don't, really. Um, I, I think... People have learned all of these different phrases about cherry picking, about cognitive dissonance, about... All and all we ever do is we just point fingers at each other and, and accuse them of this stuff. But if you're going to accuse me of something like that, you've got to give an example. You know, give an example of where I have cherry picked something specifically. Uh, and, and we can look at it. And if you've got a case, I will post a correction. But if you just make the generic thing, you're biased, you're cherry picking, you're this, you're that... I will always say, well, give me a specific example. And I almost never get one. So there you go. Okay, final comment. Um, Dean Chamberlain from also Do the Science is Fake Data. I am extremely educated on everything climate and weather. And I, along with Tony, Tony Heller again, who posted this video and many other noted scientists in his field, like Dr. William Gray, witnessed the tampering with the US climate record. And it's why many are sounding the alarm. Uh, blah 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 okay well you get the, the, the general idea but the reason why I put this in was just one thing really um, this argument says I am extremely educated on everything climate and weather now there's a number of times when I get people trying to give themselves authority they say I am an expert in x the vast majority of the time it is very clear that they are not entirely being honest about their expertise and why do I say that? And I don't know that for a fact with Dean Chamberlain specifically, but it's a, it's a notable thing generally. And, and what are the tells for this? The tells for this are, first of all, when they state their expertise, it's very non-specific. I am extremely educated on everything climate and weather. Well, if you were actually an expert in that area, you would say something more specific than that as to your expertise. Secondly, the comment that you would go on to make would be related to your expertise, because otherwise, why do that and generally you find that, pe that it's not I've, I've had various people saying you know I am a, a mechanical engineer and I can confirm that Tony Heller is right about the fact that there is rampant fraud you say well judging whether or not something is fraud is is not an engineering skill it's not something that engineers would be any better at than anybody else so why would you quote that expertise if you were then going to go on to make that statement and it's just, it's almost like when I was in school, there was a, there was a, a school girl there who I'd been perfectly friendly with. And one day she came and squeezed herself against me and asked me for a favour, which was really weird because if she just asked me for a favour, I'd have said yes. And afterwards, I realised that she was testing out her powers. You know, that, you know girls have been talking about the, the way that you have power over boys and, 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 and all sorts of things. She was testing it out. It was clumsy and ridiculous in retrospect, and I was rather confused about it at the time. And it, in many ways, it reminds me of this, 
where people are so clumsy about claiming authority. They say, I am an expert in this. And then they go on to say something that sounds, A, totally illiterate in relation to that expertise, doesn't demonstrate that expertise at all. And they make a point that where that expertise isn't even a mark of authority. So I get that quite a lot. Um, I never, ever give any credence to any of that Really, at the end of the day, if you're an expert, then you should be able to make a straightforward argument with evidence as to why something is right. Your expertise comes through the knowledge that you express. And you don't need to say, I am an expert and so on, because no one's going to just give you your word and say, oh, really? Oh, well, thanks. Well, I'm going to believe that then because you're an expert because you said you are. I mean, that's not how this works. So nice try, but no. Just one last piece of news to share with you. Um, various people who are Tony Heller fans have come to my channel and said, how about a live debate with you and Tony Heller then? Hey, hey, hey. Uh, you know, I'm sure he's up for it. And I, um, I've heard that Tony Heller's challenged you. And every time I say to them, I've not heard of a challenge. Uh, no challenge that I'm aware of. I say, oh, I'll go off and check. And they go off and I never hear from them ever again. So... Uh, I'm used to that conversation and I had that conversation again recently on Twitter but we have a development and the development is that Tony Heller has actually tweeted and challenged to a live debate so what happened was uh, somebody said uh, that I had been challenged somebody else said oh sorry I wasn't aware Malin would be challenged to a live debate already at Malin Baker what's the hold up and I said, my usual, I'm not aware of any challenge. And Tony Heller replied saying, live debate, I may be in the UK in April, which is very interesting. So I replied to that. It, Tony had said in a recent video, he's going to Costa Rica. I'm currently in Argentina. I said, so you're in Costa Rica. I'm in Argentina. Uh, here's my email address. Send me your suggestion. And let's see if we can agree something that will be of interest. And that could be very interesting. Um, but it does depend because you know lots of Tony's fans who are sort of slavering, looking for a blood fest debate. Um, what they really want is they want someone who's going to represent the consensus, who's going to defend AOC. We have 12 years to save the planet. Who's going to say Greta Thunberg is the leader of the future for us and all of these sorts of things, which people who watch my videos will know is not my position. If we can have a debate on a, an area that is genuinely of substantive interest, I'm not going to pretend to be a scientist, so we're not going to debate deep into uh, science, um, but there's plenty we could discuss that would be, I think, genuinely of interest to people, but doesn't go into there. Um, but I'm going to defend what I think, not what other people think that I'm supposed to defend. So that's one thing. And then the, it doesn't have to be a head-to-head. -head. Uh, it could be an exploratory discussion where we explore the differences and why we believe the things that we believe. That might be quite an interesting thing to do. Anyway, I've invited him to email me with a suggestion. We will bat back and forwards, assuming that he does that, and we will see what we come up with, and I will let you know when I know. Let me know what you thought of this. Was it interesting? Should I do this you know, from my point of view, it's easy to do this because there's no scripts involved, there's no research involved. Um, but on the other hand, I know that people like, I'm not going to stop doing the other stuff. I know people like the other stuff, so uh, I will keep doing that. But do people like this as well? Let me know.